I'd like to welcome you to uh, South Lake's Connecting Our Community series entitled There's No Place Like Home, getting, uh, getting you home with the support that you need. My name is Mike Smith. I guess I don't have to read that. Um, I'm uh, Mike Smith and I'm a member of South Lake's Board of Directors as well as the Chair of the Community, uh, Community Awareness Committee. This, these sessions are designed to keep our patients and our community informed about activities taking place at the hospital and also to provide a forum for you to raise questions and tell us about your experiences here at South Lake. Now, it used to be commonplace for patients to stay in the hospital until they were well enough to be char discharged uh, and awaiting placement into a long-term care facility. However, today with a rapidly growing and aging population, this is no longer the case. South Lake's new strategic plan seeks to address this by transforming healthcare relationships. We want to revolutionize transitions, build bridges with healthcare partners like the Community Care Access Center or CCAC, and treat our patients like family. The topic of this presentation, There's No Place Like Home, is a step in that new strategic direction. And healing at home keeps people in their communities. It allows for continued socialization and frees up hospital beds for those people who need acute care. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone over to Jane Casey to learn more about why there's no place like home. Jane? Well, thank you and, and welcome. Some friendly faces that I've known and some new faces, so thank you for coming. So today, we're, you're only going to listen to me for a bit, and you're going to hear the real stories from my colleagues over here. So we're going to first really start with Journey Through South Lake at Home. And then I'm going to turn it all over to Roz Gamble there, who's going to talk about our philosophy, our way of thinking of there really is no place like home, and how can we work with all of you to try to transition people home with the supports that you need. So Roz is going to talk about that, and then Mary Borello, sitting over there, will talk about CCAC, we fondly call it, and that's how we get the supports from home. Intertwined in all this is the role of the patient and the family in this journey, and how can we stay healthy in the hospital. And then the highlight of this is we have a daughter of one of our family members, Mrs. Vidian, who's going to just come up and share the stories. And I hope you enjoy that because that's the highlight for me. And then we'll be here to answer questions. So first of all, we're thrilled at the hospital to have a new strategic plan. And this is only one of um, parts of our strategic plan. And I just wanted to talk about treating patients like family. I went into nursing um, 28 years ago, and uh, I went into nursing because at our cottage I had this lovely mentor called Mrs. Mond. And Mrs. Mond was a TGH graduated nurse that graduated in 1924 and taught me, and I'll never forget this, is that always treat your patients just as you would want your family to be treated. And if you do that, Jane, then you'll be okay. And so I'll never forget Mrs. Mond, and it's really cool for me to see this as part of our strategic plan, that we truly, if we treat everyone like we would want our family treated, then that's really what we'd want. So just to South Lake, just in case uh, you're, you're new to us, we've been around for 90 years. We have almost 3,000 employees, 500 physicians, and the coolest part is almost 900 volunteers strong. Um, that support many of the activities every day. We do have nationally renowned um, programs such as the Cancer Center, Cardiac, the Arthritis Program, which we fondly call TAP, and the Eye Institute. So, you know, your journey through South Lake can start in, in a variety of different ways. Um, some people it's planned, such as surgery, but a lot of our seniors enter through our emergency department. So enter through these doors through Emerge. And what's really cool is we have the gem nurses in Emerge and they are like gems. They're geriatric emergency medicine nurses. They work seven days a week for 12 hours and they really do specialize in working with seniors. And so you'll often see them down there and they'll try to help to transition you home from our Emerge. Then if, you've, if the decision is that you need to be admitted into the hospital, then often you go to something we 
fondly refer to as the MACU, which is the Medical Assessment and Consultation Unit. It's an open area. It used to be where our chemo was given. And that's a really fast-paced, high-activity spot that you get your tests done really quickly. And we try to work with the families and the patients to see if you can go home or whether you need to go for a longer stay to one of our inpatient areas. I'm going to now pass it over to Roz, who will talk a little bit further about your journey through Southlake. So good evening, everyone. I don't think I'm as an articulate storyteller as Jane, but I will do my best. Um, I will admit that I have been nursing slightly longer than Jane, and it is always my pleasure to be able to talk to you, those people that we care the most about, patients, their families, and the community. So I do want to continue through that story um, about your journey through Southlake. Now, when you come in, and you may come in through the emergency and, and be admitted up to our medical assessment and consultation unit, you will see very, very many faces um, through your journey in Southlake, especially if you change units, which happens quite regularly. You don't always stay in the unit that you're initially admitted to. You may, through the MACU, you may move on to an, an acute medical unit, and from our acute medical unit, you may move down into, we on the third floor, we have rehabilitation, we do have some complex beds, we do have some palliative beds, etc. So through that journey through the hospital, you will see a lot of new faces and we just want to just tell you a little bit about those people you will see. We do have a geriatric inpatient team. We have a wonderful geriatrician and we do have a clinical nurse specialist and they specialize in the care and treatment of geriatric seniors and our advanced practice nurse or our clinical nurse specialist actually she works in patients and then she also works as a gem nurse. She's, she has a dual um, role within the hospital. She does see people and gets them home out of eMERGE but she also works with families and patients in the hospital to optimize their physical and cognitive abilities to get them home. And this team is available to all of our senior patients. We also have what we call patient flow navigators within the medicine program and in within the cardiac program. And they have a fairly complex role, um, but predominantly when you see them, they will be uh, introduce themselves as discharge planners. They are there to work with yourself, your family, and the community on planning for discharge and planning for home and offering you options and available resources in the community, working with our CCAC partners and getting you home in a coordinated um, model of care and helping with that seamless transition um, back into the community. There are other other programs, because I do want to talk about all of the hospital, some programs have social workers and other programs have discharge planners, but within the medicine program, our, our uh, discharge planners are, are referred to as patient flow navigators. We have a wonderful, wonderful staff of volunteers. As Jane said, we have up to 900. They are on all of our inpatient units. They provide a variety of services within those inpatient units. We have a dining program on the third floor that they help us with, a feeding program. They work extensively in our palliative care unit, our regional um, cancer unit. Um, they help with mobilizing patients. They And I will go on because Oh, it's not on that one, but uh, there is another program that I will talk about, and it's the HELP program, and they are there to help seniors reduce the risk of what we call delirium. It's an acute confusional state that often happens to elderly people post-surgery or in an unfamiliar environment like the hospital or due to an infectious um, in, an infection. Part of... Um, your part, so we talk about what we do, but we would like to talk a little bit about how important it is for you to participate in your own care. And part of that is keeping healthy in hospital. When you're in hospital, um, there's a lot of what we call deconditioning. 
And deconditioning can happen physically, it can happen cognitively, functionally, your ability to get out of bed, um, and, and due to that acute illness. So it's very important, not only for yourself, but those of your elderly parents or loved ones, to keep them active with simple exercises, moving, arms and legs, even if it's in bed, even if they, they can't get out. It prevents things like pneumonia and clots. Um, there's a lot of things other than television that are much better for your mind cognitively, like crossword puzzles, word searches. Our volunteers help with that. And we need you to be involved and informed in your health care. So one of the programs I mentioned earlier is the Hospital Elder Life Program. And it is a trained, there are trained volunteers that help seniors during their hospital stay. And they're available in the emergency and on the medical units. And as I said, they work with patients to prevent what we call delirium. They help to keep their minds active. They also help with functional. They help with our dining program. They have been a tremendous support to our seniors while they're in hospital. And that's John. That's one of our volunteers. Another program that's available to you, but more on discharge or through the emergency department are our urgent medical clinics. Um, we're hoping eventually to have these run seven days a week. Um, currently they're running five, we're moving up to six. And those clinics are avail available to patients that need to be seen quickly. So the next day or the following day. They need to have their blood work checked. They need some medication management, those kind of things. Oftentimes we find on transitions, going home and getting a hold of your family doctor is not always realistic. So we've, we offer the urgent medical clinic so that you can follow up in a quicker manner with those healthcare providers that you need to see. Jane was talking about there's no place like home. And this is our philosophy. We've engaged this philosophy since last summer and we have been very successful working with our patients and families, CCAC and our community par uh, partners. The hospital is the best place for you when you're acutely ill. There is no doubt that's where you need to be. However, when your acute condition is completed and it is time, home is the best place to be. 60% of people heal faster at home, they're happier at home, um, and at home is the place if you need to make long-term decisions, whether it be to go to a retirement home, to move into a long-term care facilities, those are life-altering decisions that should not be made in crisis. So when you're in hospital, it is a crisis situation. Those, are th those transitions in life are to be planned at a more calm, leisurely way in the support of your family and with the support of the community. Within the hospital, it is a rushed um, environment and it's very fast paced and it doesn't give you the opportunity to really weigh the pros and cons. And hospital has its risks. When you're sick, you need to be here, but any prolonged stay in hospital also has its element of risk. And I'm sure all of you are aware of what some of those risks are. I think some of the risks that people don't realize, we hear about nosocomial infections, um, superbugs, those kind of things. But there are also other risks um, that people are not as aware of that can occur, particularly with our elderly population, the longer they stay in hospital. And these are three examples of the longer you stay in hospital, the increased risk of delirium, which was that acute confusional state, urinary tract infections, we put a lot of lines in people, you know, Foley's, um, intravenous, all those kind of things, plus pneumonia, inactivity. And there is also um, a deconditioning, of, as I mentioned before, a functional deconditioning, a wasting of muscle, a wasting of cognitive um, abilities that happen with prolonged stays. So the benefits of staying in hospital for those um, that long amounts of time is, is not conducive to the health and well-being of patients. So our philosophy is there is no place like home. 
all of our patients, when they're admitted to hospital, the goal is to get them home. The right service at the right time, at the right place. We recognize that people need to have complex um, intervention, complex services, um, planning with some of that those discharges home. But the transition to a final living res um, residence is a significant moment for every patient. As I said before, um, home is the best place to make those transitional decisions. Um, I think the best story I ever heard was um, somebody saying, um, coming in and a doctor indicating that a patient should go to long-term care for various reasons. And a nurse turned to him and said, if that was your mother um, and you really thought about the fact that she would never see her house again, she would never see her pictures, she would never see her dog, she would never see her cat, and she would lose all of that if she went directly from hospital to long-term care. So when we meet with patients and their families, it is a joint effort. Families are very, very important or significant others. It doesn't always have to be patients. We try to work from admission with them on what we call early identification. So we use a combination of skills and people to come up with those plans for that transition home. So the healthcare team, and that includes our physiotherapists, our occupational therapists, speech language, nutrition, our CCAC partners, whoever, physicians, nurses, PFNs, all of those, that team, and it may be only one person, it may be the entire team, comes forward with recommendations as to what services a patient may require in the community so that that transition is smooth and healing can progress at home. The other thing we look at is housing. Very important. Where does a person live? How do they live? Who do they live with? Do they have supports? Are there other options for housing? Um, if they live alone, can they live with an, a, a child or a sibling? Is there a retirement home that's an option? is for this community in York Region, we have a third of the province's group homes, um, hostelries, um, for those with mental health conditions. So is it a group home? So we look at all of those options. Um, nothing is beyond our inquiry. We look at their address, where do they live? Because as you know, our catchment area is not only um, Newmarket, Aurora, but it's very, uh, it's urban, but it's rural as well. So there's areas within our catchment area that are very difficult to serve. So we're very cognizant of where a person lives and what services we could provide to them. It takes a lot of ingenuity and a lot of critical thinking. What are the social supports of that person? What's their network? What's their safety net? Who do they have to help? So we call in all of those things. What supports did they have in the past with CCAC or other community agents? Do we need more? Do they need less? We look at a person's capacity to make decisions. This is very, very important. Um, we always go to the patient first. Those, they are the ones that need to make decisions about their own care. But there are times when, unfortunately, they're not able to make that decision due to capacity. So we look for substitute decision maker, whether it's a child, a sibling, um, a husband, wife. It could be a friend, could be anyone, but we do include them in any of our planning. We also do look at the financial situation. It's a difficult topic, but it's imperative when you're talking about transitions and getting people home. Because not all of the options that are available to us are covered in our healthcare system. A lot of our community options aren't. There are nominal fees. Um, some are geared to income, some are not. So we have to be very conscious of the financial situation of that patient. So this whole puzzle is what we look at when we talk to patients and we talk about discharge home and we talk about supports and we talk about our philosophy of no place like home. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary.
Thank you, everybody, and welcome, and thanks for having me. And uh, it's always a pleasure to come and talk about the Central CCAC and to show how we collaborate with our hospitals, especially South Lake, um, in terms of planning and preparing patients and family members at time of discharge um, to really help patients get back into the community where they, most patients want to be. Uh, when we ask patients, where do you want to go? They all say home, <laughs> and rightly so. Um, the Central CCAC certainly has a vision mission and value statements um, in terms of our vision being outstanding care every person every day which is what we strive for and our values are certainly working with our collaborative partners um, and South Lake being one of those uh, main hospital partners. What do we do? So Central CCAC is a mouthful, you're right, uh, and sometimes people don't really remember or understand what CCAC says, but when you say home care, they understand fairly quickly. Home care? Yes. Okay. What can you do for me? Um, well, there are 14 CCACs in Ontario, just to give you a little bit of background. And what do we do? We are a single point of entry, so basically you can call our main office, uh, and we have uh, two op main office contacts at our sites, and we have intake and referral staff who are uh, there readily available to provide information and referral information at your, at your fingertips. And so they're readily available all the time. We also provide in-home services, as, uh, as I'll discuss a little bit further. Uh, I mentioned information referral, and we are also legislated to determine eligibility for long-term care placement uh, for patients uh, when they are needing this uh, transition of care. We also have uh, a school program uh, where we provide school services, uh, nurses going into the school to provide assistance with care. Uh, and Central CCAC has over 80,000 patients, clients that we serve each and every day. So it's a bit uh, overwhelming to, to understand that or to hear that. Uh, but certainly that's, we have many, many clients, patients on our program. Uh, we work very closely with our 46 long-term care homes. We have several hospitals that we work with. Uh, we have a number of community support agency groups that we have partnerships with and 28 service providers that we have contracts with uh, who provide the in-home services. So what are some of the services that CCAC provides? Certainly um, for those uh, who may have required um, CCAC services in the past, we have nursing services, personal support to help with bathing uh, and dressing and transferring, nutritional counseling for those uh, folks who have uh, a need for assistance with their diet. Uh, speech language pathology is often referred uh, for patients who have difficulty swallowing. Uh, or physiotherapy with just helping with strengthening exercises and mobilizing patients um, when in their home. Occupational therapy is also a common referral that we receive uh, to help with assessments and transfers and equipment needs uh, and uh, applying sometimes to assistive uh, programs for funding purposes. So the care, CCAC care coordinator uh, is responsible for assessing patients for services, for developing a service plan, coordinating that plan, and navigating that, uh, the patient, the client, through the system. Um, we have uh, a, a strong sense of quality, so we, have a, we really focus on our care coordinators to consider uh, the concept of safety, science, and service from the patient's perspective, so making sure that they are uh, not putting patients at risk, uh, ensuring that they're providing best practice to patients, the best type of clinical care, and certainly making sure that the experience of care for the patient is, is at the top notch. Now there are patients who have challenges and who need um, options to consider. So that's what we do. We look at what are the all the options that you can consider um, when returning home into the community. And so we will work with the patient and work with the caregiver, work with the family to consider some of the, the choices, whether it's in um, providing in-home services in the home dwelling or helping with services in, a, in assisted living or perhaps a retirement home setting, uh, we will look at that. But we will also recognize that some patients and family members really want to start that long-term care placement process and we can start that application wherever they are. We also provide convalescent care services, so really um, providing that support for patients coming out of hospital who need a little bit of um, time to convalesce, to, to get better, to get stronger before they return home. Uh, 
And some of the things that we do uh, as a priority for CCAC with our patients and family members is linking them, is really helping them to understand what's out there in the community. So whether it's affordable housing, whether it's assisted living programs, uh, we are really trying hard to emphasize the community support agency groups who have a wonderful day programs for patients, for clients in the community, and, um, and not well used and really try to emphasize the benefits of those programs uh, when a loved one can't be left home alone, for example. We work very closely with some of our associations that, like the Alzheimer's Society and the CNIB or the Hearing Society, um, where we look for support and uh, suggestions in terms of how to manage uh, clients who have those needs. And working again with our community support agencies for other needs like Meals on Wheels or transportation needs or homemaking services like cleaning. Um, we, we certainly refer patients to the assistive devices program, and we do have respite care that we will determine eligibility for for patients who require a bit of time to recuperate or to give the caregiver a break, and they're usually respite in long-term care homes that are available for patients uh, through it for on a yearly basis. Uh, we have care coordinators as well, and the care coordinators are responsible for helping you find a, a primary physician, a family physician, if you don't have one. And I know that with the Ontario um, motivation to help patients find a primary physician, that is one of our focuses as a CCAC as well. And I've talked about these two, the short stay respite, which is a 60-day uh, program, and it's usually a total of 90 days per calendar year. Um, convalescent care, again, is also a length of 90 days in a calendar year, so those are great programs that people will utilize if, for example, that they can't return home directly from hospital but will go into uh, a long-term care home for some convalescence. So that's an excellent program that we have had great success with. Uh, for clients, patients who are being discharged home and who require CCAC services but are mobile, who can get to a clinic, we have set six clinics and we're opening a seventh one. Uh, we have one here in Newmarket uh, and our mobile clients will refer to our CCAC clinic where they're um, operated by nurses and they provide infusion therapy and uh, different types of nursing treatments to help them um, be and return to their care, a normal care. Um, we have advanced appointments at these clinics, which is fantastic for those who actually continue to work or who have busy appointments and they want to know that there's a nurse going to be there. So they'll go to the clinic, they have an appointment, and they are in and out very quickly. Uh, Home First is one of the programs that has been a great success to us and has worked greatly with our patients um, coming home from hospital and it's enabling them to have enhanced uh, personal support hours of services on a weekly basis um, for a 60-day period so it helps them recuperate um, post-discharge from hospital and help them get back to uh, their activities of daily living and also provide that support to the caregiver who needs that additional support um, that they may not have had prior. Uh, this program, Medication Management Support Services, is a, is a, is a great program and it's, uh, I'm being biased because I lead it, um, but we have pharmacists that actually uh, go into the patient's home, uh, the family's home, and actually do a consultation. So they will do a full review of the medications, they will reconcile their medications and follow up with the phys your physician as well as the pharmacist to make sure there's a, a clear medication regimen. And part of it is teaching and helping you understand what you're taking, how to take it, and when to take it. Um, oftentimes we did a survey and most patients felt that they knew exactly what to take, how to take it, when to take it, and that post-consultation they came back and said, my gosh, I had no idea that this medication interacted with that medication. I had no idea that I was at risk of having side effects from a type of medication that I was taking. So one of the things that is very uh, interesting is that a lot of patients do not only take prescription medications, but over the counter or in herbal products. And when you're mixing all of those medications, it can be uh, quite dangerous um, if they're not being monitored appropriately by your primary physician. So we have pharmacists going into the home, reconciling medications, working with the physician and the uh, pharmacist, the community pharmacy, um, and then providing a medication schedule for, for the patient in the home. Uh, and you 
you bring that medica- medication schedule with you wherever you go to all your appointments. Um, we really are trying to uh, recognize that if you can address medications, it really reduces the, n- the number of times you will go to the emergency department. And over 20% of patients who go to the emergency is often due to an adverse event related to medications. We recently started a new nursing program uh, where we have clinical nurses going to patients' homes post-24 hours uh, from hospital. And the intent of this is to have the nurses go into the home and really make sure that patients understand what their discharge instructions are, help them understand their medications, help them work through any challenges they may be experiencing. And oftentimes this has really helped in avoiding an emergency visit. Uh, Again, we have worked very closely with um, expanding our role as a CCAC, which we have been mandated to do, and determining eligibility for patients who would like to go to an adult day program. We will complete that uh, intake assessment, as well as determining eligibility for assisted living and housing. And we have also expanded recently and hired mental health uh, coordinators, nursing coordinators, to work with the schools uh, and children uh, for mental health and addiction, which has uh, been a very uh, rewarding program to date. And that sums up CCAC for now. I'll pass it back to Roz. Thank you, Mary. It is my privilege to introduce a daughter of one of our patients. Um, Doris Vidian uh, came into South Lake. Unfortunately, she fell and fractured a hip. Um, I, and she was on our muscular skeletal unit. She had surgery there. And after surgery, she moved on to one of our complex floors for rehabilitation so that uh, she could return home. She participated in the pool program here and um, over several weeks, probably a couple of months, right, Marian? Um, she was able to return home. She went home with a wheelchair and uh, moved to a walker. And I today she did over 10,000 steps on her own with the beautiful weather. So I'm inviting her daughter, Marianne, to come up. She, uh, You do have the Being Well uh, magazine there, and Doris is part of that article in there, and she was generous to come and participate in a video. Your stairs over here, if you'd like. Um, so that we could uh, tell the community all about the voice of the patient. And Marianne is... Uh, been very kind to come and talk to you a little bit about her story and her journey as a caregiver and a daughter of one of our patients. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my mom's 96. She was admitted to South Lake uh, last August uh, and had to undergo surgery here, um, which was a fairly traumatic for someone of, ni- of that age. She was 95 at the time. And uh, the prognosis for someone healing at that stage of their life, life isn't really good, um, but uh, I think she had just an incredible attitude and with the help of the team here, um, was re- really realized that if she was going to go back to her home, she would have to start an exercise program and quite honestly, she'd never exercised before in her life. So. Uh, getting her out of bed and then getting her to the physiotherapy um, was all to the credit of the hospital because she would not have uh, gotten out of bed, quite honestly. But she really connected with the physiotherapy department and they strongly encouraged her once her wound healed to participate in the swimming program and she hadn't swam for over 10 years. So she thought she would try it and with their help was able to embark on a really great swimming program, which was wonderful for her because she was, once she had the surgery, she was told she couldn't put any weight on her leg for 12 weeks. So she was kind of like a flamingo at 95, which is not a good situation if you can imagine but with the swimming program because it's weightless almost uh, she was really able to exercise Um, the accident happened on August 3rd we took her home on September the 18th and we continued to do all of the exercises that we got from the physiotherapy department Um, I should just back up a little bit the CCAC um, participated 
at the at her home to help really give us advice and direction on what would work in the house and what wouldn't work in the house and what changes we needed to make very quickly. Um, we had about three days and we had to, with their help and some direction, we were able to put in a handicapped bathroom. We have a chair lift for her so she can get up to her bedroom. Uh, we put in little ramps. Uh, we had to put in one new door. But we were able to do that. Um, just whatever the direction they gave me, I was able to implement. I, I should have said, I'm not a nurse. I have no background in nursing. I'm the only one speaking tonight probably that doesn't have a medical background, but I can follow instruction pretty well. Um, so <laughs> with their advice and direction, we made a lot of changes to the home in three days and, and brought her home. Even though she couldn't uh, put any weight on this leg, we were able to, uh, with the exercise, really strengthen the other leg. And also um, she started strengthening her arms so that she could transfer herself pretty easily from a wheelchair to the chairlift or from a wheelchair to her own furniture, which was wonderful. Um, I'm a big advocate of bringing people to their home, which um, we've done with pretty well all our family members that have, have been in a critical situation. Um, in, in your home, you get to have all the things that you've been surrounded by your whole life. My mom's lived in the same home since 1917. So to move her to some strange place where she doesn't know the neighbors, she doesn't no, she's not familiar with the surroundings would be really probably very difficult for her whereas when she's in her home own home she can go walking she can have people in she has people in for lunch or dinner uh, we can bring our pets there um, it's it's just more conducive and better for her not to uh, not to change it up too much now when she comes to South Lake she considers this a hotel she really likes Southlake. It's not that we're frequently here, but she really likes it. She likes going to the sixth floor uh, outdoor garden or the third floor outdoor garden. So she makes the most of the situation, and that's really what she's done in, in her home. I brought with me tonight her pedometer because the physiotherapy uh, here really stressed that it's important for her to exercise. So she wears this pedometer and she's walked over 10,000 steps today. Um, when she got home, the CCAC arranged for a physiotherapist to um, come to the house and uh, Paul came every week f for quite a while and he really um, motivated her and encouraged her and gave her positive feedback on what really was possible because I think as you get older you think oh I can't do that it's too much effort and someone said tonight it's easy to watch TV it's not easy to exercise and I also mean exercising the brain we learned here in the hospital about these cognitive tests that they give you oh my god they're a little scary I know now I practice my counting backwards from a hundred and seven so you guys better be practicing it because that's one of the questions they ask you you have to count backwards from a hundred the secrets out <laughs> um, so we quiz her on the news that we hear on CNN or who's on Dancing with the Stars or who's the top singer on American Idol all those things um, are part of her daily routine. My mom has macular degeneration, so she can't see as well as probably everyone in the audience, but um, it, it's important that we, we uh, keep her engaged in what she wants to do. And it, it's really, we do it because she wants to. It's, it's, not, uh, it's really a labor of love for us to do it, uh, to work with her. Um, we still have the CCAC come. They come and do blood work at home every Thursday to check to make sure her blood is in good shape. And we have somebody come for two hours on Wednesday that gives us a bit of a break through the week. And uh, we've learned through the CCAC and through the hospital what services really are available to us. And they're really just there for the asking. You just have to find out what's available and just ask for help because there's lots of people out there that are willing to help. Um, when I explained to the York Region YRT Transit that my, my mom's age and her mobility and getting her up here to South Lake, 
they gave her a lifetime pass which has kind of turned out to be a bit of a joke because it's usually every 12 weeks you have to get a new one, but they figured at 96 it wouldn't be a risky thing to do. <laughs> so she has a nice lifetime card which she carries now and can come up to Upper Canada Mall or whatever, wherever she wants to go. Um, that's, I mean, that's basically our story, but if you've got any questions, um, I don't mind answering. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ted. Hi, this is for Mary. Um, for for uh, initiating contact with the CCAC, is it always done through the hospital or could someone just call the central line up if they felt that there was a service or need that you could help us with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, really, anybody can make a call to the CCAC. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to come from a hospital. Doesn't have to come from a physician. You, as a as a patient, client, family member, can call the CCAC directly and ask for information, or ask to be referred, or to get more information about how to get services in place. Great question. Is having a nurse come to a home to do blood work something new they've started? No. If, if a patient is coming on services for CCC requires a professional services and the lab work is required because they're not mobile, they can't get out to, um, to, the, they can't get out to their lab, then we would uh, provide that service for a time limited period. Okay. If uh, you had a, a, a member of your family at home mm -hmm. that you couldn't get out but they needed to have blood work once a year, do they provide that? We don't provide lab work only. You have to have, there has to be a professional service in place. And that if has- If you're already with CCAC. If you are active with CCAC and receiving a professional service, then you could have lab work added to that as a service if it's related to the reason See, why you're- when I asked about it, I was turned down. Okay. So, so perhaps for I could- me, this is why I'm asking is, the, is, yes. is this new? Uh, it's not new. Uh, it, it's essentially, we've had lab services uh, for a very long time. It's just we do uh, have the professional service in place first. And then if, the, for example, if you're receiving nursing for injections and, it's, and you need the lab work related to it, then we'll add lab as well. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, if a, a patient requires long-term care placement, First of all, who would look after that? Would that be CCAC or would it be the hospital? If the decision is made, that's what they need. Mm -hmm. And is there, are there long waiting lists for these places? Because I would imagine there are quite a few people who need those placements. Right. Would you have to wait for weeks? That's a really good question. Um, so CCAC is mandated, is legislated to determine eligibility for admission to long-term care. So we would do a fulsome assessment and then we would complete the paperwork uh, required and uh, submit that to the long-term care homes of choice that you would want to uh, submit for. And of course, there's multiple long-term care homes with various wait lists. And so there are uh, some long-term care homes that have short wait lists from zero to three months. And there are long-term care homes that have very long wait lists that could be three to four years. So there is a variation depending on which home you apply to. Yeah, the capacity for long-term care homes, I think, is something like 98-99% uh, in terms of fullness. And there's very little uh, vacancy, so hence the, va the wait lists that happen. Um, and so what we do find is that uh, we there has to be a, an appropriate match for a patient's care needs to a particular bed in a particular unit. So the CCAC is responsible and mandated to manage that, so we uh, will work hard hard to try to make sure that your choices are your choices and they you prioritize them how you want and oftentimes what people will do is you are uh, legislated you can apply up to five choices and what some folks do is they will apply for shorter choices so they can get into those choices uh, into those long-term care beds and then wait for their preferred choice uh, to go into them 
This is not really a question. It's more a comment. Yes. There are other alternatives to than someone waiting for a long-term yes, care bed. That's I right. represent Sunrise Senior Living. We provide long-term care for our seniors, and we provide the same kind of care that they do in long-term beds, and we don't have a wait list. So this could be a sort of a time gap, a stop gap, if you need immediate placement until a long-term care bed becomes available. So there are other choices out there. You have to you know, go the private route if you, you know. Right, that and way. that's what our hospital care coordinators and the patient flow navigators and Roz and I on a weekly basis meet with this, the staff, the team of CCAC care coordinators and the patient flow navigators, the discharge managers, the social workers, what are all the options? And certainly that is definitely an option that we look at to see, you know, could we they go into a retirement home setting, to a, an assisted living setting, could they get that as an interim measure at least to, until they're ready to return back home? So thank you for that. I would reiterate that what Mary says. I mean, we meet twice uh, a week and we pretty much discuss a lot of the patients in the hospital with the care coordinator and with the discharge planners and the PFNs to give families a, lift, a list of options because there are many options out there and people are not always aware of what's available and it's up to us to provide that information so you can make informed decisions because there are lots of options we work with Sunrise quite a bit we work with a lot of the other retirement homes they offer respite care um, been very very helpful to us mm -hmm. in accommodating the needs yes. of some of our clients and patients because um, they're very complex yes. and their needs are very extensive so we need a long list of a wide variety of lists and there's lots of new things coming into the community and keeping informed about what's coming up and what mm -hmm. services are available um, so we work very closely together because I may learn something and Mary learns something or the PFN talks to you and learn something new so it's a continual conversation all the time I think we have uh, time for two more questions one comment I guess and then a, a question is that okay you go ahead and you have the microphone, please. Um, I know you have to apply for CC ahead of time, because we do. And, you know, we're stressing home at first, right? What happens when they call and say, we have a bed available, but you feel you're, the person you are looking after is not quite ready that year? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. a year later or six months later, they need to go. Right. Right. Uh, okay. What so, the, but then you go to the beginning of the list, so you even put five years behind more. Right. Why is that system allowed? It's a good question, and it is a it's a regulation, it's a legislation that is in place that CCCs have to follow, uh, and so <laughs> it's legislated. We basically we know that uh, if patients are waiting for extended period of time for a bed, uh, then the wait lists get larger and larger. So they changed the regulations in 94 to say you can only apply up to five choices. If you are applying to those five choices and a bed offer comes up in the community and you decline that bed offer, your file closes. And that's what happened. So they were trying to clean up all the wait lists because there were many bed offers going out and people were declining. And so the ministry wanted to clean up those wait lists to say, we want people who are truly ready to wait for admission. And those are the people who should be on the wait list. So that's why they did that back then. How can you be on the wait list? Um, Alzheimer's is not curable. Right. You could mm -hmm. be perfectly fine one year. Yes. And totally disabled the next year. And so, so how they can justify that kind of thinking? Again, you know, like to me, you shouldn't have to go if you refuse because you say, okay, I still want to keep mm -hmm. my person at home. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is going to come a time when you can't. Right. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to go on another waiting list. You should be on that list. And CCAC should be fighting for that. Not well, saying, well, it's legislated. Mm -hmm. This legislation is not working because, I mean, I'm told if you want your parent into a home, you have to apply the waiting list is five years. Mm -hmm. If you want them to go where you would like them to go. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I was told, oh, you probably won't get called up. Well, I got called up two years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I refused because I felt my mother at that point was not ready to go there. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But then when I went back to CCAC, now has come a time where I really have to seriously look at this. I got really shot down and I got told all oh, this and this and this and this legislation. Well, that legislation should not exist because time changes, especially for Alzheimer's patients. Right. Mm -hmm. And they can be perfectly fine one year and totally gone the next year. Mm -hmm. And there's not a thing you can do about it. And for, I, I might say that we are all unfor uh, fortunately or unfortunately guided by legislation and acts within the ministry and the and the government and the wheels do they do they do travel they do they do move very very slowly it's a combined effort to change less legislation it's not only those that are guided by the legislation but it is the public that also needs to advocate for that it, that legislation was passed in 1994 that's a long time ago and the environment and the communities changed and um, we can't disagree that those things do need to be looked at more frequently the clogs move a little bit slow, slower than we would like, um, uh, but it is a joint effort of all of us to to work together. To If I could just voice. quickly comment, first of all, I congratulate you for pre-planning <laughs> and organizing <laughs> and, and not waiting for that day when it's all of, all of a sudden a big crisis. And so thank you for that. Um, the other thing is I want to say that, you know, this is an engaged group. You came here for a reason. You know, we need to change things because some stuff doesn't work. And you're, you're pointing out where something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Your MPP, you know, there's, there's lots of other ways to go to try to make it a better system because you're doing the right thing. You're being proactive and, and you're saying not right now. But you know what? Maybe it would have been yes right now. Maybe something would have changed, but for your mom it didn't. So I think that we all have have to collectively get together and try to make this the best system that it can be. I think we're almost done. Uh, do you want to, do you have a quick question here? Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you very much again, ladies, uh, for your, for your insight, your help. Obviously there's a lot of questions, great engagement. Uh, thank you very much for showing up this evening. This presentation uh, among others of, of the, uh, in, in the future, as well as our, our last a CAC presentation are going to be on the internet. So what I'd ask you to do and invite you to do is please share this with your local MP, share this with your local MPP, and uh, and also your other friends in the community because people who are you know, certainly have questions about these types of issues need to get information and, and sometimes it's just a matter of spreading the word. So this is on the internet or will be posted on the internet in the next couple of weeks, I guess, Dave? Yeah, or less. Okay, and uh, so please uh, feel free to review the presentation again. And uh, and uh, lastly, if you uh, if you'd like to receive an email about our future events, please give us your email address on the surveys or on the web or or actually on the paper survey or on the website. And um, I'd like to also thank uh, Tammy as well as uh, Matt and Dave from Corporate Communications for uh, showing up this evening and certainly our guest speakers, Mary, Roz, and Jane. It's great to have you out tonight, and uh, I thank you as, uh, as the participants here this evening for joining us this evening. So thank you very much.